even though this is the most recent exam for MA262, this is the first one that I'm recording. So I just finished up uh, my finals for MA265 and 266, so I have a pretty good background in the material for this course, although I did not take uh, the course itself. So some of the ways that these problems are worded uh, and, and generally uh, asked is, is a little bit different than what I've seen in those two classes, but uh, we should be we should be fine here. I'd also like to note the uh, what's it called the answers for this exam that are online. Uh, you know the the one connected with this exam form through the past exam archive is one hundred percent wrong. If you go through and uh, if you were going through this exam and you you were like, oh my god, why? Why, why, are the, why, why does it say that these answers are correct? It's because they're wrong. I'm pretty sure they posted the wrong form. Uh, you'll see if you, if you uh, take a look at what we do here and then compare that with what the uh, answer, answer key says the answers are, you'll see that it is uh, most, definitely, most definitely wrong. Okay, question one. So we have a first order linear differential equation here uh, with x greater than zero and we're looking for y at e and we're given an initial condition y at 1 is equal to 1. So let's rewrite this. y prime minus 3 over x times y is equal to x squared. This is in perfect form already to use integrating factor. We know that this term uh, on, our, on our y here, we will call p of x, that's negative 3 over x, and then rho of x, which is our integrating factor, is e to the integral of p of x, so negative 3 over x dx. This becomes e to the negative 3 ln x, or just x to the negative 3. Now we know that uh, with integrating factor, we can say that y of x, our solution, is equal to 1 over rho of x, so that's x cubed, times the integral of rho of x, x to the negative 3, times q of x, where q of x is this term on the right hand side, x squared dx. So we get x to the negative one here, this will become uh, this will become ln x plus c there. And now we can apply we can apply our initial condition y at one is equal to one. So one is equal to one times zero plus c. So c must be so c must be one. We're looking for y at e y at e will be e cubed times 1 plus 1. That gives us 2e cubed. And I, I'm so used to going and checking the answer uh, for these, but uh, nope, we can't. Question 2. Uh, consider the following three differential equations with that initial condition, y at 0 is equal to 0. Which of the following, uh, which of these problems have a unique solution on some interval between a and b containing zero uh, due to an application of the existence and uniqueness theorem? So let's have, let's stick a huge number line down here. And what do we know? Well, our initial condition is for x at zero. And what we would like to see in order to apply the existence and uniqueness theorem is that there is some finite uh, you know, box that we can draw on this number line between two between two discontinuities. So let's say that x is equal to negative ten and x is equal to ten. Uh, we're we're uh, made made our equations up here undefined in some way. And if that was true, then we can say that due to the existence and uniqueness theorem, uh, because we're starting at this point here, we can go back. Uh, as far as we can before we hit a discontinuity, so all the way back to negative 10 and all the way forward uh, to positive 10, and that would be that would be our interval a and b. So let's figure out how we find these discontinuities. So taking number one, we have y prime plus 2y to the fourth is equal to x to the fourth. And what we do with all of these is we will divide off anything that's on our highest term derivative. In this case, there's, oh, and there's nothing. There's a coefficient of 1 on there, so uh, we're good. We don't have to change anything. And are there any discontinuities here that make uh, any, anything that's left over uh, undefined at all? Uh, no. No there, are, no, there are not. And as a result, as a result, we cannot define 
a finite bound for uh, this this rectangle uh, or yeah, rectangle for between a a and b uh, there is no interval there uh, for which we can apply the existence and uniqueness theorem what about two well for two we will have to divide off this y cubed to get y prime by itself and that's equal to sine x over uh, over y over y cubed so what is what is this what is this undefined uh, for in terms of x by the way um, because you know th this is this is a number line this is a number line on x um, so this is this is undefined again nowhere so there are issues there are issues with y right but all we care about is x sine x is defined everywhere on this number line so yet again we cannot identify we cannot identify a bounding uh, rectangle because we don't have any discontinuities as we vary our values of x um, additionally seeing that y at 0 is equal to 0 well actually that might not be too big of an issue here we're, we're not we're not directly solving it okay anyway uh, so we can't apply the existence of uniqueness theorem for 2 what about 3 that gives us y prime is equal to sine x well we, we said that we said that this thing right here we couldn't apply the theorem for this thing also uh, we cannot apply the theorem for sine x is defined for all x and so there is no there is no discontinuity here at uh, a or a discontinuity here at b that we can that we can kind of uh, you know, bound ourselves between so none of these three problems uh, work what about three the solution to y prime is equal to 4x y squared we are we are solving this so this is a separable differential equation so we can rewrite this as dy dx is equal to 4x y squared and then let's see we can divide uh, we can divide 1 over y prime over here multiply a dx over here and now it's completely legal to integrate both sides we get negative 1 over y is equal to 2x squared plus c we can rewrite this as negative y is equal to 1 over 2x squared plus c and we can just move that negative move that negative over there okay we're told that y at 0 y at 0 is equal to 1 what can we do what can we do with that information um, well we can plug that in 1 is equal to negative 1 over 0 plus c uh, so c c must be negative 1 and there is there is our answer right there uh, answer choice e Four. consider this equation here which of the following is its general solution so this is a little bit of a weird substitution that we have to do here we will be substituting v is equal to x plus y otherwise known as y is equal to y is equal to v minus x so that means that uh, y prime we can just replace that with v minus x prime where that prime is uh, with respect to x and so substituting everything here we have v minus x prime is equal to well what's going to be uh, inside this square here uh, that our x will become v minus x that minus x will take care of the x that we have there so we get v squared minus 1 now let's evaluate this left hand side uh, the derivative of v with respect the derivative of v with respect to x uh, well what is actually yeah sorry we'll, we'll leave that for now we're not actually directly evaluating it but the derivative of negative x with respect to x is definitely negative 1 so v prime minus 1 is equal to v squared minus 1 we can add one to both sides of our equation and now now what can we do well this is dv dx and we have a separable equation here so we can we can say that one over v squared dv is equal to one dx integrating both sides negative one over v is equal to x 
plus c. So rearranging just like we did in that other problem, v is equal to negative 1 over x, uh, x plus c. And uh, undoing our substitution, finally, v is equal to x plus y. So we can subtract an x there, and we have our solution, which is solution uh, answer choice b. Let's find a general solution to this differential equation. Whenever you see this kind of thing with a bunch of uh, polynomials running around and uh, you know implicitly defined y's uh, in here, and, and also if you see uh, a bigger polynomial set equal to c in your answer choice, you should immediately be thinking, you know, this equation, this equation is probably exact. Well, what does that mean? Well, if we rearrange this, let's multiply this denominator up. We will have dy dx multiplied by x squared plus y, and then this is still equal to negative 2xy plus 1, but we can move that over, and let's put it in parentheses. So we have 2xy minus 1 over there, and all of this is equal to 0. Well, when we have our equation in this form, we can call this portion of our equation m, and this portion n, and if my is equal to nx, that's the partial derivative of m with respect to y, and m with n with respect to x, then our equation is exact and we'll be able to solve it uh, much, much, much easier. So my will give us 2x, and nx will also give us 2x. So our, our hunch paid off, this equation is, is exact. So uh, what do we need to do now? Well, we need to take the integral of m dx and compare it with the integral of n dy. So what's the integral of m dx? That will be x squared y minus x. And then on the other side, n dy will give us x squared y plus y squared over 2. So we see that these two terms are overlapping here, and then we have two unique terms. We will only count the overlapping terms once, and then uh, we can write we can write our solution uh, just like this, as x squared y minus x plus y squared over 2 is all equal to some constant c. And there we go. And so what you can do to work back to kind of see where see where this is see where this is coming from is uh, that that this thing right here its partial derivative with respect to x is m its partial derivative with respect to y is n and the reason that this whole check here uh, works to to tell if it's, if something to tell us if something is exact is because we know uh, back from from calc three that if you have some kind of uh, normal, you know, we just have a polynomial function here that uh, if we call this, uh, I, forget the, I forget what this Greek letter is called, but like the, the pitchfork looking thing, that the partial derivative with respect, to, with respect to y and x is equal to the partial derivative with respect to x and then y. That's uh, Clairaut's, Clairaut's theorem. And where where's our answer choice? We should probably pick that. There we go. It's A. Number six, we have a ball of two kilograms dropped from a height of 10 meters, blah, blah, blah. We're given a lot of initial conditions. We are finding the speed of the ball right before it hits the ground. So one important uh, thing to recognize at the start is that the mass of the ball does not matter at all. Uh, we're not accounting for air resistance or anything, and any ball uh, of any weight or mass falling uh, in a gravitational field will fall at exactly the same speed. So we can completely ignore this little data point up here. Now what we'll do, and this is similar to a lot of Calc 3 problems that you might remember, we will start with acceleration as a function of time. That's negative g. So we every every unit of time uh, we will, our, our velocity will gain uh, g units or negative g units of well, uh, meters per second or velocity. So what that means is that we can integrate our acceleration and we'll get velocity. So v of t is equal to negative g t. And uh, we also need to add a initial condition term. But since we're told that our initial velocity is zero meters per second, that just goes to zero. Now integrating velocity, we'll get position p of t. That is 
negative g over 2t squared plus p0, where p0 is our initial height, which is 10 meters. Now when we want to when we want to find the speed of the ball right before it hits the ground, we will need to solve for uh, the time at which that occurs. And that time will be when our position function is equal to zero, so when we're hitting the ground. So we can say that zero is equal to negative g over 2 t squared plus 10. And we can, uh, let's see, subtract that 10 over, change the sign on both sides, make this a 20 divide it by g and take the square root. And we don't need a plus or minus because time, uh, time cannot be negative. So if this is, our, this is our time t, let's find the speed of the ball at this time. Well, the speed of the ball is the magnitude of v of t, the absolute magnitude of v of t. That will be uh, the absolute magnitude of negative g multiplied by root 20 over g. Now this doesn't seem to be any of our answer choices, but uh, let's let's see what we can do here. Uh, we can remove that negative and and the uh, absolute value sign, and then we can factor this g in as a g squared, and so we end up with with twenty uh, root twenty g meters per second right before it hits the ground. Okay, question seven: Which of the following statements? is true. So, okay, we see that four of these, four of these uh, answer choices have to do with multiplying a and b together. So let's take a, 1, 0, c, 1, 2, 0, and multiply it with 2, 2, 1, 0, 4, 0. This is a 2 by 3 matrix. This is a 3 by 2 matrix. So uh, how you figure out what, what we're going to be left with is these two have to match up for, um, the, the inner two have to match up for the multiplication to even work, and the two that you're left with, the outside ones, uh, will be the dimension of your output matrix. So we get a two by two output. Now, uh, doing this multiplication, we'll, we will be multiplying this first row by this first column to get our first position in our matrix, then We'll multiply the second row by the first column to get our second position, and then we'll repeat that process with this second column over here and this first and second rows to get these two positions in our output matrix. So what do we get here? We get uh, 2 plus C, then 6 here, 0 there, and eight here. Okay, so what can we what can we do what can we do with this? Well, let's take a look at uh, or just think about the dimensions involved with with a and b. So what is a? A is a oops sorry a is a two by three matrix and b transpose if we transpose b let's see b transpose will just be uh, well, we'll take this first column and make it our first row and take our second column and make it our second row. So 2, 2, 1, 0, 4, 0. So B transpose is also 2 by 3. And I'm just, I'm just noting the dimensions involved with this. This is an actual uh, computation. Now, what about A transpose? Well, uh, it, it, B transpose, which was originally 3 by 2, we transposed it. It became 2 by 3. The same kind of thing will happen with A. When we transpose it, we will get a 3 by 2 matrix, and B is already 3 by 2. And we know that for any kind of equality statement like this to be true, our dimensions have to match up. We will end up with a 2 by 3 on the left and a 3 by 2 on the right, which, uh, which does not work. So that cannot be true. Now what about B? Well, uh, if you Later on, when we when we talk about inverses in this class, you'll see that uh, AB can only be equal to BA uh, when both matrices are square and they have very uh, special properties relating to related to each other, uh, where one is the inverse of the other. So if you were to visualize the transformation that one does, uh, the other one exactly undoes that transformation. 
So, uh, but we can talk about just what would why why this is wrong from a dimensional standpoint. We know that when we multiply a and b together, we get a two by two matrix. So we have a two by two here, and we're setting that equal to well b a that will be a three by two multiplied by a two by three. We know that these two middle dimensions have to be the same for this multiplication to work, and the other two that are left, three by three, is the dimension of our output. And no two by no two by two matrix is equal to a three by three matrix because they just they don't they don't even live uh, in the same space. Now we have a direct rule for why C is wrong. If you take A B transpose, you get B transpose A transpose. You have to uh, flip the order of the two matrices being multiplied in here. So this is false. Now we're left with uh, D and E. If the 1-1 one, one entry of AB, so 1-1 one, one is, is right here, the first row and the first column, uh, if that's equal to 1, then C is equal to negative 1. Well, if this thing is set equal to 1, 2 plus C is equal to 1, then C, yep, C is equal to negative 1. That checks out. Question 8. If AX equals B, where A is a matrix and, B, and X and B are vectors, excuse me, which of the following statements is not necessarily true? So let's map this out. We have A, which is an M by N matrix, where M and N can be any, uh, you know, non-zero positive uh, integers. And then we have, oh, oops, and we have X, which in order for this multiplication to work would have to be n by 1, uh, because it's a, it's a single vector, so we know that it's either a row or a column vector. Uh, in this case, it has to be a, uh, <laughs> a column vector. There we go, with, with n dimensions. Uh, n dimension, you, you know what I mean. And then uh, that's equal to b, and b is just going to be formed by these two dimensions that we have left over, so it is m by 1. Okay, and we'll, we'll note that this is this notation is rows by columns. That'll help in a second. So A, if A has three columns, so it is a M by three, then what do we know? Uh, well, they're saying X has to have three entries. That would be true, because in order for this multiplication, AX over here to work, this N by one has to match up, or the N in the N by one has to match up with this three. So we have M by three, times three by one, that's the only way that can work. And we know that a three by one uh, matrix is just that kind of, like one, 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 that kind of uh, column vector there. So A, A checks out. What about B? If A has five rows, so we have five by N, and then this can be N, N by one, as long as it's the same N, then what are they saying? Then B has five entries. Well, that's true, we know that Whatever this M is has to match up with, with this M uh, for the B there. So we're left with five by one right there. So that checks out as well. What about C? What about C? If X equals zero, then B equals zero regardless of the entries of A. Okay, so I'll step back from the, the computation of this for a second to just talk about what what's actually going on here. So this this you can think of as a linear transformation uh, represented by A being applied to the vector X, which gives you the output vector B. And one product of linear operators, linear transformations, everything that's going on here, is that a linear transformation must map the origin to the origin, which implies that if we plug in the origin, so X equals zero as our input vector, then we must necessarily get the origin back out. So this, uh, this is true. And this will come in uh, all over the place when we talk about null space and uh, all, all, that, all that kind of good stuff. Now, but null space though comes up in D. So if B is equal to zero, then does X have to be zero regardless of the entries of A? Well, let's test it. What if what if A is a two by two matrix and it's just zero, 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 and we have some X1, some X2, and this is equal to zero, zero. Does X1 and X2, do they both have to be zero for this to be true? 
Uh, in fact, they they do not. We can have we can have 17, 32, whatever whatever numbers you want in there. This will always hold true. And why is that? Well, we could get into the visuals of it and, and talk about how uh, what this matrix is really doing is saying, I'll graph this out. This is saying take the first. Uh, oh, I don't know if I'm going too far ahead for you guys, but maybe this maybe this will help. So uh, you can define all of R2, or we, we define our normal coordinates in R2 by two uh, standard vectors. So we have the vector 1, 0, which def defines you know the unit of length on the x-axis, and we have the vector 0, 1, which defines our unit of length on the y-axis. What these matrices are saying is, uh, at least for this R2 example, is take your first basis vector and put it at the coordinates specified by this first column. So it will take the first basis vector and map it to the origin. It will take the second basis vector, uh, likewise, and also map it to the origin using this second column. And so now, if we're trying to, uh, if we're trying to take, we're taking this input vector and, it, whoops, sorry about that. So it doesn't matter what coordinates we try to, we try to plug in here, because we've redefined space based on uh, the, the vectors 0, 0 and 0, 0 for our, for our x-coordinate and our y-coordinate, no matter what we plug in there, we're always going to end up back at the origin. So in this case, uh, in this case, x could be, x could be uh, anything. So this guy is not necessarily true. And then e, b is in the span of the columns of a. So uh, the span of the columns of a just refers to the column space of A, and that that's just that's just defined as you know any any output vector that you can get uh, from an input vector in in this in this sorry in this equation here. So the set of all B that satisfies A x equals B that that is uh, that uh, spans out the entire column space of A. So yes, that this guy does check out. Or so D is our answer there. Oh my god, there's a motorcycle going by. Okay, nine. We have we have this thing going on here, uh, an ax equals b equation, and we're looking for x3. Really, this is saying, really this is saying, so we have ax, that's xx. We have ax is equal to b. We know that this is our input vector, this is our transformation matrix, and this is our output vector. We're looking for the linear combination of these columns uh, that gives us that gives us this output here, and all we need to do to find that is to set up a three by four augmented matrix with one one zero, two five one, three three two, negative three nine, negative two, and I will copy this over to make sure I don't make any mistakes in the row reduction, and we can get going. Let's subtract row one from row two. We get zero three zero. 12, and we can make this a 1, 4, subtracting two row twos from row 1, we'll get a 0 there, uh, minus 8 gives us negative 11, and then let's subtract row 2 from row 3, we get a 0 here, and a minus 6 here, this becomes 1 and negative 3, we can we can subtract three row threes from row one. We get a zero. Uh, that, will, that will give us plus nine here, so minus two. And there we go. We see that in order, uh, in order to get, in order to get this vector here from a x equals b, our x vector must be given right here. So x is negative two, four, negative three. We're looking for x three, and that's just negative three, the the third position, the third entry there. 10. For which value of c does the following system have infinitely many solutions? Let's just make an augmented matrix with 3, negative 2, 5, 1, 0, 2, 1, 1, negative 3, 6, c, 1. So let's try to get this uh, into the form where we can find a c value such that an entire row of our matrix is all zeros. Let's uh, let's add row one. Whoops. Let's add row one to row three. That gives us zero, four, 
c minus 5 and 2. Let's subtract 2 row 2's from row 3. That gives us a 0 here, a minus, ooh, wait. I think I, I think I already did something wrong because that's not the answer I was getting before. Let's let's uh, let's try let's try that again. I'm not going to cut that. That was too minor a mistake to cut. Okay, zero. We are we are adding it. Yeah. So, oh, that's what I did. <laughs> yeah, that's what I did. Okay, four c plus five and two. We are we are adding. And then let's subtract two row twos from row three. We get zero here, three here, and zero. So we see that we'll have infinitely many solutions if we have a, a free variable in this system, which we will uh, identify by seeing if we can get a, a row of all zeros, which will occur when c is equal to negative 3. 11, we have three vectors here. They are, they are uh, vectors in R2. Which of the following statements is wrong? Okay, let's graph these out. Because we kind of, this is a, one of the nice cases where we, we have the, the privilege of being able to graph things. When you get into the, you know, crazier dimensions, it's much harder to see what's really going on here. So we have u, which is 1, 0. We have v, which is 1. I kind of didn't draw this correctly. 1, 0. 1, negative 1. And then we have w, which is which is, oh, sorry, I did that wrong yet again. It's negative one, one. Negative one, one, that's V. And then W is two, negative two. Two, negative two, okay. Which of the following statements is wrong? Well, immediately I'm drawn to C, which is our correct answer, and you can really just see that by uh, looking at this graph here. The set UVW is not linearly independent. These two vectors, these two vectors, v and w, are a direct linear combination, or, or sorry, they're, they're a multiple of each other. If you multiply v by negative 2, you get w. And as a result, one lies on the span of the other. The other way that you could solve this without even graphing it out is just uh, thinking about it. So if we had these two vectors here, they are linearly independent. So what do they, what do they span? Because they only have two entries, they will span all of R2. They span all of R2 uh, because uh, they, they, they do not lie on each other's span. So, you know, you can get anywhere in R2 with a linear combination of each. So is there any place in R2 to put a third vector such that it is not already in the span of the first two? Uh, no, there, no, there is not. And so for any set of vectors with n entries, you cannot have uh, you, you cannot have a set of a set of uh, you know n plus one vectors where each have n entries. So in this case, we have three vectors each with two entries. You can't have that set uh, be linearly independent. So let's uh, let's take a look at some of these some of these other ones. Uh, e w is a linear combination of u and v. Yep, that's true. It's equal to 0u uh, minus 2v. We already agreed on that. What about d? vw is linearly dependent. Yep, that's the whole reason why this set is not linearly dependent. And then what about here? Uh, u dot v is equal to negative 1. That's just the, you know, the, the normal dot product of these two. Yep, that gives us negative 1. We multiply these two together and add uh, these two multiplied together. So that's good. And then u transpose v will just be 1, 0 multiplied by negative 1, 1. That gives us, well, this is a 1 by 2 and a 2 by 1. So we get a 1 by 1 with an entry negative 1. And, you know, if we flip this around, it will just, it will just uh, you know, also give us negative 1. You can test that. You can test that for yourself if you're, uh, if you're doubting me. Okay, and 12. We have a linear transformation from R2 to R2, uh, given uh, by this standard matrix A here. So what are what are the what are some properties of linear transformations that might help us here? Well, we know uh, we know that any linear transformation any linear transformation can be represented 
as the standard matrix for that linear transformation multiplied by that same input vector. So the input vector uh, with the transformation acting on it is the same thing as the input vector multiplied by the standard matrix for that transformation. We also know that T of Cx is equal to Ct of x, uh, where C is just some constant. And then finally, we know that T of x1 plus x2 is equal to T of x1 plus, whoops, plus T of x2. Okay, so that lets us ask, that lets us answer uh, two of these right off the bat, because these must be uh, necessarily true no matter what a, u, and v are. If we have two input vectors in here, one of them is multiplied by a constant, we know that we can take that constant out and that we can split this entire expression up uh, because it's just the sum of two input vectors there, applying both of these rules at the same time. So two checks out. What about three? Well, we know that uh, the, the transformation applied to x is the same thing as x multiplied by the standard matrix A. So yes, this will work for, for any x in R2. What about number one? The transformation of u is negative one, one. Well, uh, if, if you can figure out you can figure out uh, what matrix A would work for that, that would be pretty cool. Uh, it turns out it is the, the identity matrix. And OK, uh, this is a little bit of a detour here. But let's take a look at this. The identity matrix, I don't know if you guys have talked about that or not. That's just 1, 0, 0, 1. And it comes back to what we were talking about up here with uh, the, the vectors that we're defining R2 with. And what this would say as a linear transformation is take your first vector at 1, 0, and 1, 0, and don't move it. Keep it right there. And take your second vector and keep it right there. So our coordinates defined before the transformation will be exactly the same as how we're defining coordinates after the transformation. So this, uh, the transformation of u, which is negative 1, 1, that would only end up being exactly the same if, uh, if a up here was uh, that identity matrix, but it's not. And if we apply the transformation 1, 0, 1, 2 to the, ve to the, to the vector negative 1, 1, we're going to get another 2 by 1 output, which gives us 0, 2, which is, uh, you know, no good. Okay, so 2 and 3, 2 and 3 is our answer. And we are done. So the only question that I'm a little bit iffy on, because I'd really like to see the answer choices, is uh, this one. This is a little bit weird as far as existence and uniqueness theorem problems go. But other than that, um, yeah, there, there we go.